Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in to our webinar. Saskatchewan Soccer Association is proud to host launching an adaptive soccer program. Tonight we have uh, Matt Greenwood, the Executive Director of Pickering Soccer, Tyler Hillstead, the Technical Director of Grassroots and All Abilities Programs with Weyburn Soccer, and myself, Lara Schrader, with uh, Saskatchewan Soccer as the Coordinator of Member Services. So tonight, uh, first we're going to have Matt present, then we're going to have Tyler present, then I'm going to let you know some of the programs and services that we have coming down the pipe, and there will be an opportunity for questions at the end for both Matt and Tyler or myself. For now, we're going to leave everybody on um, mute and you are able to unmute yourself, but if you just leave yourselves unmuted, I will mute you back um, just to preserve sound quality for everyone as we are recording this webinar and we'll be posting it on our website for those who are not in attendance. There's also a group chat there. You can type your questions during um, the presentation if you have questions or you can save them for the end and um, if there's nothing else then I will introduce um, introduce Matt or I will allow him to introduce himself so one moment Okay, thanks very much, Laura. Okay, let's get this. There we go, that's better. So thank you very much for, for inviting me this evening. Hopefully uh, I'll be able to share a, a ton of information with you. I do apologize in advance. It's usually information overload, uh, but my contact details are, are available at, at the end or by all means by reaching out through Laura. I'm happy to help out and provide as much information as I can uh, if I miss something or a question pops in your head as you're, you're heading home and you, you realize that you'd want to ask something more. So by all means, uh, an open open book and happy to share. So we're look, going to look at disability soccer. I'm going to apologize in advance because some of the language might be um, perceived differently as either appropriate or not appropriate. The, the, the language around uh, disability sport or sport for people with a disability um, is somewhat of a moving target so I'll chop and change between a variety of different phrases but hopefully none of it will be be offensive so over the next half an hour before we hand back the reins to, to Lara and Tyler we're gonna have a quick look at the medical versus social model of disability uh, we'll look at the inclusion spectrum some brief outlines of a, a practical session and some things to think about the Canadian player pathway or pathways as they exist right now uh, and then some club concerns or some common questions that uh, that I come across uh, with some answers as well. So not just uh, the questions and leaving them out there, but we'll provide some guidance. And then some resources, some signposts for you to, uh, to find some additional information, which is uh, some really good, really good content that's out there. So quickly about me, uh, as Laura mentioned, I'm the executive director of, of Pickering Football Club and have been since uh, late 2016. Uh, prior to that, I was the club development manager with Ontario Soccer for almost 10 years uh, and had the opportunity there to, to develop the club excellence program, uh, which uh, reached about 150 clubs and has now morphed into what we now know as the, uh, the National Youth Licence that Canada Soccer are, are rolling out. Uh, but during that time, got a really good opportunity to connect with a lot of grassroots clubs uh, and assist them uh, with developing uh, an accessible, inclusive uh, program. Uh, as part of my kind of volunteer side of things and, and the stuff I enjoy to do in my free time, I was the co-chair of the Para and the Blind Soccer events at the Toronto 2015 Para Pan Am Games, which was a fantastic experience. Um, getting up close with the, uh, the Brazilian National Blind Squad, which was a, a huge treat and just incredible to see those, those athletes um, in their co competitive environment. The year before that, I uh, was the chair of a, a test event ready for the Pan Am Games, the 2014 America Cup. I uh, was the head coach for Canada Deaf Soccer for two years in 2011 to 2013. And I'm an occasional assistant coach with the Canada Soccer Para team uh, when they need uh, somebody to jump in if their assistant coach is, is unavailable. 
Uh, I have my uh, UEFA B license, which is now a, a national B license with Canada Soccer, and uh, also the the Coaching Disabled Footballers course, which is a, a great course offered by the Football Association in England. Um, it's an eight-hour sort of a one-day course, but a great way to to check a, a lot of boxes on understanding a range of different needs when it comes to uh, accessible soccer. Um, I have a degree in sports science from many, many years ago and, and a little more recently a, a master's in the sociology of sports. So that helps kind of give people the context that I'm not just the admin guy and I'm not just the techie guy. I, I definitely have both feet, uh, one in each camp, so I can kind of see the, the needs of this type of program from a variety of angles. So this is an important quote for me. I'll just give you 10 seconds to have a quick read. And I will actually read it as well. So you put your stake in the ground. It does not mean that there is no flexibility, but if you've done your research and have your evidence, it is easier to engage others. The engagement is focused and driving toward change. And that the real two words that I, I need to underline here uh, are the research and the evidence. Um, it's categorically out there when you're talking to boards or you're talking to coaches that are, you know, maybe a little bit uh, wary or cautious of getting involved in an inclusive or accessible program that the research and the evidence is out there there's definitely a market there are kids and adults out there that want to participate in in soccer um, they want to be given that opportunity um, it's not scary it has all sorts of great benefits for both the athlete but also the the coach involved in it the volunteers and also the parents on the sideline to get to see their their child or their, their adult in a, a new light, um, but also they get to connect with other parents on the side. So it, it's out there, there's lots of great practice, lots of academic research that, that shows that these programs are important, that they need to be offered. So I would certainly push back if, you know, if you're having to make a presentation to your, your club or a district board and they're a little bit unsure, reassure them and I'll share with you some examples that these things are happening and they're out there. Um, so let's jump on the jump on the bandwagon now and start to make make this happen. So why do people play soccer? For the non-disabled, it's about staying in shape, having fun, being part of a team, passion for the game, developing social skills, meeting new people, and developing bonds. And of course, I imagine you're one step ahead of me. This is really not too different from people with a disability. So all of those reasons would be a, a key part. What I would say are there are some maybe added or more specific um, reasons. So something to, to prove, whether it be to themselves or to, to other people or to their family members. A sense of purpose and belonging, which is, which is really important. Um, and finding a peer group, uh, because a lot of times, uh, athletes with a disability or people that would want to join this program really don't have a huge connection of, of friends, particularly if they're um, older and not in school. That network can be severely diminished with, with friends that they would hang out with or play with. So that opportunity to find a peer group and have that sense of belonging is really, really important. And a big part that we focus on uh, with our program here at Pickering Football Club um, is around that fun and friendship. Um, and getting out of the house, Again, it's, it's one of those risks, particularly within a school environment, that uh, uh, a student um, may not get the opportunity to, to be part of the physical education class. And sometimes it's, let's say, easier, in inverted commas, to, to send them to the library or maybe have them sit on the side and do the scoring for, for the rest of the students participating in the, the activity. This is an opportunity for them to get out, whether it's out of the house or off the bench, and be, be active. So the medical versus social model, and we'll just go over this quite briefly, um, is really the, uh, the two ways of, of thinking around, around disability, or the two main ways. So from a, a medical model perspective, it's, it's really focused on a, on a negative slant, and it's all about the, the individual that, uh, as, you, as it says here, that the, the child, the issue is with the child, and that the child is faulty, that they get labels that are negative connotations. Um, the impairment becomes the focus of the attention, not the ability, but the disability. Um, and you'll see down that column of, of 
variety of different ways that the medical model presents itself um, and society remains unchanged and that was really kind of the the old way of thinking if you like um, I'm pleased to say that there is change probably not as quick as we would like it to be actually I'd say definitely not as quickly as we'd like it to be um, but the social model really puts the focus on on society as a whole um, we have within Ontario the uh, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disability Act, AODA, um, which has, has really start to raise awareness, uh, but there's a lot of, neg uh, sorry, not a leg non negativity, pushback that the law itself doesn't really have teeth. Uh, so from for a, a club example, uh, the first part of this new AODA was that as a club, we need to have a customer service standard. So we have to have a policy that ensures if somebody needs um, uh, a document uh, that they that they either can't can't read for for one or many reasons, we would provide it in a different format, or we would sit with them and we would talk them through what is in that that document. Um, the same with um, a a working dog that they're totally allowed to come into our facility, into our dome. Um, there's no barrier for um, for the person with their, with their working dog. Um, so it's really putting the onus on society as, as businesses, as companies, as associations, as clubs, that we're making ourselves as inclusive and accessible as, as possible. Um, and the real pushback, as I said, right now within Ontario is that there are some big players, some big companies that really aren't pulling their weight. Um, and there need to be some fines. I think that's what's going to start to really shake this up. Uh, and AODA is, is groundbreaking. It's very forward thinking, um, but there's a lot still to be done when it comes to sort of changing society's, society's perspective. Uh, and from work that we've done with Ontario Soccer, they also had to comply to AODA. So they also had to have a customer service standard in place. And what we actually did was use some best practices from the club here in Pickering, from a couple of other clubs that are running uh, accessible programs and kind of use that to spice up AODA. AODA is a very dry law. Um, I'm sure most laws are quite quite dry, not very engaging, but presenting it in a way with a soccer theme, um, showing kids involved in, a, in an accessible program, showing how a wheelchair user would come into a facility and get to participate, still get to come and be right at the side of the pitch watching their children play. Um, was a great way to present the law uh, and get more people engaged in that in that discussion. So, as with everybody, and a lot of this you'll realise comes down to any other program that you're you're offering. Kids, adults, coaches want some sort of meaningful competition experience, um, and in doing so, we're trying to make sure that every game, whether whether it's within the practice or a competition itself provides the right level of challenge for all participants. And in a soccer context, this would include physical, technical, tactical, psychological, or social factors. So we're touching on that four corner model there that is um, strongly uh, ingrained in Canada soccer's coaching pathway. Why is it important? Obviously for enjoyment and satisfaction, any program needs to be challenging and developmental, not too easy you're going to start to get players bored and not too hard because they're going to start to, to get frustrated. Again, you would do the same thing with any other program that you, you run because you know that your U12 girls are going to start to get frustrated if every session is, is the same or is too easy. You're always aware of where each player is um, within the program and you're ensuring that it's at the right level of, of challenge for them. So in doing that, we look at that that middle range of making sure that they're all being challenged appropriately within the group, whether they have a, a special need or not. Um, you're supporting those that are striving to keep up and you're also challenging further those that are forging ahead and seeing if there's a, a next step or a next progression that they can move towards. Again, exactly the same thinking as, as you would have in any other program. So the inclusion spectrum, and I'm just going to read this as a screen grab I got from a a football association document gives the coach or teacher different ways of coaching football to mixed ability groups without focusing on the individual impairments. Instead, it focuses on the football and how football can be presented to all players. Uh, one of the 
icebreakers that I do in uh, my workshops is really around um, appropriate language. And one of the words that's on that chart is, is footballer or soccer player. And the thing I tell everybody is that when these kids or these adults with additional needs come to your session, they're not there to be courageous. They're, they're not really there to prove a point. They want to be there to play football. They just want to get on the field and kick that, that ball around, whether it's shooting a goal, whether it's having a game, whether it's learning a new skill. Um, and that's really what the inclusion spectrum is about. It's about focusing on the game. So there are four avenues there, parallel games, modified games, open games, and then disability soccer specific. So open games, everyone in the group is able to participate with minimal or no adaptation or modification. This would include warm-ups, integrated games, individual skill development, or cool-downs. So an integrated game um, is the one there that might raise questions, would be around, you may have different zones on the field where you can still play a game, but within a certain zone, you may have two wheelchair users uh, playing against each other one by one. And then as the ball moves into the next zone, maybe you've got um, two players, two amputee players playing together one-on-one. -on -one. So you still have everybody included in one bigger game, but you're integrating a variety of uh, different needs in there in a safe um, and fun way. Modified games occur when changes are made to the game or activity in order to promote inclusion. Uh, and again, this comes down to your, your coaching. So altering the space, adapting some of the rules, and varying the equipment, again, something that you would typically do with, with any other session. Parallel games, when everyone plays the same game or game theme, but they're, they're organized in ability groups where the activity is set at a level appropriate to each group. So this would be rather than that, that first example I used where everybody's on the same field, this may be parallel mini fields where they're all doing a passing drill or a passing technique, uh, but within their um, disability specific group or at their ability level. And then finally, disability soccer. So play in impairment specific groups, either for safety reasons or as part of the competitive structure. Uh, and the two kind of examples here that always jump out, blind soccer and power chair soccer. So uh, power chair soccer, particularly the risk of injury um, if the power chair rolls over somebody's foot who isn't using a power chair, um, obviously is a, a huge risk and danger. Uh, a blind soccer, if you've got a mix of uh, people on the field wearing eye shades that are playing in a blind soccer format with other people that are sighted uh, can, can also be a, an added risk, obviously, with running into each other. So within a practical session, as I've mentioned earlier, the four corner model, um, and we try and integrate that into what we do within our all abilities program here at Pickering Football Club. So you're, you're always focusing on the technical, psychological, physical and social components. And from week to week, session to session, there might be a little bit more of one and a little bit less of another. So for example, our season end session that we just had on Saturday morning um, was a little bit of technical, um, but really it gave the kids the opportunity to watch um, a couple of guys do some fantastic juggling um, to kind of really engage the, the kids. And they loved watching all the, the tricks and spins that these guys could do with balls. Um, and then also the social bit. So at the end, we went into the event room. Um, there was cake, there was streamers, and it was kind of a party environment. So we weren't on the field full on running around and playing and kicking the ball. It was some other ways to ensure that we, uh, we encouraged the, the players to you know, grow their love of, of soccer. So when you're doing your session planning, and as I said, there'll be some, some resources, some signposts at the end. Um, when you know who your registration is, who your group of players is, um, and if you've got the opportunity to uh, find a little bit more out about them, see what you can do from a research perspective to, to see if there are some impairment specific resources or guidelines out there that can help you. A lot of times the, the number one source will be mom or dad, and they're going to to tell you an awful lot about what, what little Johnny likes and what he likes to do and you know whether he's nervous to get on the field, uh, whether he's you know confident in a, in a big group or whether he'd really like to do more one-on-one -on -one work. Um, so you'll get a lot of that guidance. And then session plan in your group. So as your, as your coaches grow within this program, they're gonna start bouncing experiences and ideas off of each other of how they've worked with different players in the group 
um, challenges that they might have had to overcome to make sure that the session ran smoothly. And one of the things I love about our program is that we have a, a number of young leaders that are sort of in their late teens that are really buying into this and are very keen to share at the end of the session what they what they did ready for that next next session so similarly at the end of the at the review of that practical session feedback from the players and free feedback from the parents we are just involved in a program night right now with the uh, queen's university where we're looking at uh, quality participation uh, and a lot of that is down to sort of one-on-one -on -one interviews and conversations with players and parents at the end of a session uh, about the quality experience they had and whether they really felt that they belonged and they had fun and whether they were in, you know, engaged with the, with the coach or the, the volunteer that was with them and assisting them and getting a real sense of the quality of, uh, of that experience. Not just that, you know, that the pennies looked great and the balls were, were all inflated and, and the session progressed nicely, but the real sort of personal experience that those players and parents got from the session. Um, and then reflecting. A lot of times you'll, you'll do this with your other sessions. Uh, you know, you're driving home and you're reflecting on what worked and what didn't work and what situations came up. Again, you know, take that, park it, and then when you get to meet with the coaches again, bounce that idea off them and see if other people have a, have a solution or may have a trick that they can share with you. So Canadian Player Pathway. Um, a lot of what we do right now is down at the bottom of that page. So grassroots pan-disability club programs uh, is really the bulk of it. So within Ontario, we have uh, clubs that are quite closely linked to Special Olympics. Uh, and Special Olympics are really kind of helping coming in and running those programs. Uh, but then we have programs that are called Breaking Barriers or All Abilities. Uh, I'm trying to think of some of the other names out there. It's, it's just a range of different names and it's a, a range of different needs on the field at one time. Um, if you go in with the mindset that you want to do a program for uh, blind or visually impaired players, you've got a very long road ahead, which might mean you, know, you get one player and then maybe a couple. And it's going to be a long path. From a grassroots perspective, open the door, let the players come in, see who you've got to work with. Um, and if you can work on a one-on-one -on -one basis with each of those players, then so much the better. Um, and then that'll ensure that they come back, they've had a positive experience, somebody looked after them and really cared for them, and they'll keep coming back. Our program here in Pickering started 12 years ago with uh, three players. The week after that, we dropped to one. Uh, but the, the founder at the time persevered and persevered, and we're now at about 70 to 75 players in our indoor season, and that grows to about 90 in the outdoor season, as well as some other offshoots that we've, we've started to uh, develop some other programs. So you've got to persevere, but if you open that door really widely to begin with, then you can start to work with the group, and then those pathways open up for Special Olympics players. You'll see there on the right-hand side is really well-resourced. Uh, and has a very good system to get players through to, to have the opportunity to represent Canada at Special Olympics uh, worldwide. Um, the Canadian Deaf Sports Association has something of a, a system for athletes with a hearing impairment, um, but it's a bit fragmented uh, and it's a bit challenging. And then on the left-hand side, we have a men's national para soccer team, which is run by Canada Soccer, and it's the only disability soccer program that they have um at, at this stage hopefully they'll they'll think about growing more in due course uh but that's the one that they they support and that's for athletes unfortunately right now male athletes but there's a huge push to um address um the female side of the game as well but that would be male athletes that have cerebral palsy have had a recorded stroke or a traumatic brain injury uh and they're eligible to compete there so if you have any players within your programs by all means, reach out to Drew Ferguson, uh, the national para soccer coach, uh, and his email address is on the Canada Soccer website. Um, he's always looking for, for new players um, because we're, we're starting to lag behind some of the other nations, so he's always desperately recruiting. Okay, so as a snapshot, here are, um, what have we got here? Three, six, nine, 12, 15, 16. There's actually another four or five clubs on there. I think I, I counted a couple of weeks ago, and we're about 21 clubs across Ontario that are running some type of program. Um, so by all means, whether you, you reach out to, to me or not, 
you're more than welcome to reach out to some of the contacts at these clubs. They're all great people and they're happy to share what they're doing and how they do it. Um, some of them are on social media, so you can see some of their, their feeds on, on Twitter or Facebook with their programs. Uh, but we're starting to, to get some traction now. We've got some great club programs happening. And our next challenge is what's the next step beyond there? So more competition um, and starting to maybe build a bit of a pathway and a coach education um, stream as well. So club concerns. Wow, I'm going to have to talk quickly. So club concerns. Here are the, the questions that typically come up. So we'll work our way through them. So do we need to have qualified coaches? Yes, but qualified is a tricky word because there's no qualification out there, at least in Canada, for coaching uh, footballers with a disability. Um, what I would say is a coach that's got something along the lines of an active start or a fundamentals course is a great start. Um, maybe they've got a background within the school system uh, or within a, um, a, a clinic um, or some sort of uh, part of the healthcare industry where they have a background in, in athletes or individuals with a disability that they could also bring to the, to the table. Um, but I will say our, our founder and a couple of people that worked in the program have just really believed in the power of, of soccer and have a bit of a coaching background, not substantial, but enough to know what a good session looks like. They're very personable and they're very engaging. And I think that's the biggest thing that parents want to see. Um, they don't want to feel like it's another, another clinic session. They just want to feel like this is their kid getting out there playing soccer. And that's really, really important. Um, and then also, from a, a qualified perspective, anything else that um, the provincial body would expect or require a recreational coach to have, a uh, police background check, et cetera, et cetera, would be, would be necessary. Who should lead the program? So as I mentioned, passionate people, people that are not gonna be afraid to spend a bit of time chatting to a parent for, for 20 minutes or half an hour after a session um, to help them through uh, a situation or explain what their son or daughter have just done or how things have gone. Um, but people that just believe in in getting every kid on the field and that, you know, this isn't just for those that are, that are able to get out there and, and, and run and be part of a team, uh, a competitive program. Are there added insurance needs? No, there's not. And in fact, if you, if you challenged a parent that they would need something more, um, there's a whole human rights conversation that would explode in that, that instance. Uh, so from a, an insurance perspective, we treat every player the same. They come and they register just as they would with any other kid or adult in our program. So they go into the Ontario soccer registration system. Um, so they're registered as a player and their insurance coverage covers them to be part of a sanctioned program. But we then take the opportunity to ask the parent, is there anything else you'd like to share with us about your player um, that can help us ensure that we get, give them the best experience. So are there some coping strategies that we need to know about? Are there some things that they particularly don't like that we would keep away from, whether it's you know loud noises or bright colors or, or lots of people on the field? So just asking those questions um, kind of honors that added duty of care that you have for, for this group, um, but in a, in a positive way uh, and ensures that the player gets the best experience and the parent then gets the peace of mind that you've asked a lot of great questions and that you really care about their, their kid being on the field or adult. Is the program more expensive to run? Um, no, it's not. Um, but what we do as a club, uh, I know a lot of clubs are, actually offer it for free. What we do is go after a lot of grants uh, and these programs usually sell themselves from a sponsorship perspective. So you're able to really offer some good subsidies there to bring that price down. And also as a club, uh, we support with some of the field time that we're able to provide to, to further bring uh, that cost down. So our program for a, uh, I think it's a 14 week block is $95. I know other clubs that charge 120, 125. And as I said, other clubs charge absolutely nothing. So it's really up to you um, as to where you want to, to price point that and who's, who you can work with. How do we find volunteers? So they're in your club. Um, our a best example of this, and I know other clubs that have, have bought into it. Um, at the time, we went to, after our U12 and our U13 competitive girls, um, mainly because girls are more attentive, if I can say that, and they're not going to just run to the goal and just insist on pounding shots into the back of the net, which the boys' teams usually do. Um, but 
the girls' teams actually worked really well and the girls would come back season after season. Um, and as best as possible, we would organise the All Abilities session around the same time, just before or after the girls were practising. So they'd do our session, then they'd go and do their own practice. Um, but they were great. They would stay with the player. If the player needed to go to the washroom, they would, they would go and, and escort them there and make sure they come back safely. They'd stay with them on the field. Um, just a general sense that they're, they're not getting distracted, um, as I mentioned, as some of the boys were, were more inclined to do. But with some of the older players, we've been able to encourage them, the U15s and the U16s, to also come and help out. And we do a, a three-hour training course on a Saturday morning, sort of a week or two weeks before the season starts, and bring all of those new junior volunteer coaches in to learn and understand what, what they're going to experience. A lot of them are after their volunteer hours, but it's a hugely uh, beneficial experience for them as well. Where can we find more information? Next slide. Oh, not the next slide. Sorry, I was inserted one here. So these are our programs at, at, at Pickering. Um, you'll see in the middle there are All Abilities, all abilities Soccer and Multi-Sport Program, a junior age 5 to 12, and then senior age 13 plus. Those are our bread and butter courses that we've been running for the last 12 years. And now what we've evolved into that are some support, kind of some gateways. So that All Abilities Active Start and All Abilities First Involvement. Two different ways to approach this group and see if there are other players that might be ready for some soccer, but after they've done something that's more kind of multi-sport specific. And then at the, at the top of the tree, they're actually not aging out our players at 18, but starting to now offer an adult program, which we hadn't done previously. So I'm really happy to, to see that we've introduced that. And then ideally, some of those players will find their way into a national opportunity with Special Olympics or Canada Soccer, but for the most part, they stay within our grassroots program. So resources, lots of resources out there. Um, the bottom two there, Everyone Plays and Achieving Accessibility, are two Ontario soccer guides that are on the Ontario soccer website, uh, a really useful one that talks about kind of the law from an Ontario perspective, and one that really talks about what that looks like on the field, what to think about before you get the, the players on the field, the questions to ask, what you should think about with the field setup, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then bottom right there, you'll see Special Olympics have been around this for a lot of years and have developed quite a few resources. I think they have a current one on their, on their national website specific to Special Olympics uh, football. So four resources here that are really good. I'll start, the, so the bottom one, CDPP. Um, as I mentioned, that one is, is something we're partnering with Queen's University around quality participation. Uh, and some good resources there. Just above that, Ontario Soccer's website, uh, and they're linked to Accessibility and Disability Soccer, which has those two guides that I just mentioned, uh, as well as a directory of clubs that are uh, out across the province running programs. And then the top two, NCCP has a 45 minute uh, online course. I think it's about $15 and a really good kind of high level overview of accessible, inclusive um, coaching for athletes with a disability. And then the top one there, Jumpstart, is an online course. It's about two, two and a half hours. I think it's $30, but really delves a lot deeper into um, uh, disability sport. Um, anybody that's done the Respect in Sport program, it's by the same guys that do that. So it has the same feel to it, uh, but really kind of does a deep dive into um, uh, accessible programming. I thoroughly recommend those top two, top two programs and, and a great kind of, prerequisite if you like for whoever your coaches might be to send them to, to go online and do those two courses there's a, a first opportunity for their, their sort of their their professional development okay so with all of that said almost done i'll remind you again and hopefully that's come across the research is out there the evidence is out there um, if a board is a decision maker see this in front of them for me this is really a no-brainer heck there's lots of clubs doing this there's lots of experience out there We've got, to, we've got to start something, whether it's with one player or three players. Word of mouth will travel very quickly within the community when parents start to share with other parents that, hey, there's a great program at the club down the road. We can send our, our, our kids there. It, it, it's, a, again, a no-brainer. So finally from me, um, my Twitter handle there, I use that for a lot of... Um, communicating and promoting best practice that's out there, whether it's in Europe, South America, but very much on a um, 
disability soccer sort of vibe. So feel free to, to follow me and see some of the things that are being shared there. Um, if we don't have time for those questions at the end, my personal email address is there as well to, to reach out to me. And I also uh, write a blog um, with some of the experiences that I've come across from whether it's a, a blind soccer session um, or delivering a pan disability session. And just kind of sharing that information, it's more powerful if it's out there and people can, can benefit from that. Laura, that's me, a little bit over time, I do apologize, um, but hopefully everybody's still awake. No problem at all. Thank you so much, Matt. So we'll come back to questions with Matt at the end. And now right. if Matt stops sharing his screen, then we will be able to turn that over to Tyler. All right, let's get started here. Here, uh, thanks, Matt. Uh, um, always great listening to you. Pickering Soccer, uh, I've highly praised them down here and a lot of conversation I have as they kind of help me uh, get started or get on the right path towards starting our program down here in Weyburn. And uh, it's always good listening to to them as they've paved the way, I guess, in a lot of this programming. Um, so I guess a bit about myself as I'm Tyler I'm with Wayburn Soccer. Uh, just recently come into the technical director of Grassroots, which has been my passion for quite a few years. And, uh, and now uh, into the All Abilities program, uh, which has become my new passion and, uh, and my new drive. Um, just recently a certified C license coach and sat through my B license part one through last fall and uh, be trying to go through my evaluations here this spring. Uh, I guess kind of what I'm going to do today is I'm going to kind of share my why and my experience of starting uh, all abilities uh, here in Weyburn and uh, it started last year on the pitch when uh, I noticed there was a family who had a child with autism and their other child was out playing on the pitch and the parents were arguing and forcing this kid to sit down and watch their other son play when all he wanted to do was go out into the field. And that kind of just drove a stake through my heart. And uh, it really got my brain thinking. Um, and the next night, it happened again. And, you know, I, I said to my wife, I said, this isn't right. And uh, she kind of looked back at me and I kind of both shook my head and it kind of started the whole uh, drive towards what can I do to make sure that there's no longer children that are sidelined because of their abilities in our, in Weyburn, in our community. And I think of Weyburn soccer that we're a community program and the true definition of community is full inclusion is everybody. And, and we weren't meeting that in my opinion. So I really started this whole um, research into me, into this program and the all abilities program and uh, went to my club president and said, you know, this really is bothering me. Uh, do you mind if I take the league and do some research into different options and, and maybe see if we can bring a program for disabilities into in the Weyburn and uh, he gave me his blessing and I guess that's where we came across um, you know the Special Olympics talking with them and uh, I figured out that with Special Olympics it wasn't to the all inclusive to where I was able to include physical disabilities and so that's where I, I came across Pickering FC and with their all abilities program and so then kind of Echoing what Matt said, we um, and their advice from their board was to do our research. Um, so, kind of our vision with Wayburn Soccer is that we want to provide a fully inclusive uh, program for children with any disability, and that our goal would be to provide the one-on-one -on -one support, and that we'd want to welcome everybody onto our fields. So, 
taking the advice of doing the research, it kind of, these are kind of the main uh, resources that I had went through and that I had read and I made a, a player program or an all abilities program document, which stated, laid out kind of what, what our program involved from what we were looking to achieve for age groups, um, how we were going to attack for volunteers, what we we're going to put in there for coaching development, uh, who we we're going to partner with as far as um, information on disabilities, because I know soccer and not so much on the disability part. So I really wanted to make sure that we created um, relationships with those people who are the professionals around there. And so through these resources that are on this page, um, I was able to come up with that document. And I went and we met with Inclusion Weyburn. I met with Special Olympics Weyburn. And I actually sat down with the school board and presented um, kind of what I was going to lay out to our board. And just to make sure that I didn't leave anything out, that I really had a good plan or a good foundation going in to starting this program. Um, so yeah, those are the three, the three kind of main groups that I kind of went through as the experts in disabilities and inclusion in our area. Um, and so with their blessing of, of that document, I took it to the board and presented it and the board automatically a favor, voted in favor of our all abilities program. So then that kind of just kicked off to the next phase of uh, um, reaching out to these three organizations and what we're going to be starting uh, a program and we got into the the phasing um, which would be the first part finding volunteers for us I, I found the volunteer training like Matt said most of the kids that volunteer for me came out from our club and it was an email out to everybody within Weyburn soccer announcing that we are starting an all abilities program and what we aim to achieve from the program and that we'd be looking for volunteers. And within two days, I had 10 emails um, back of parents who said their children are interested in volunteering for the program. And I was quite blown away by how quick that was, but I was quite happy to see them. And, and I think that's a big shout out to what the school system or what the education system is doing in regards to inclusion uh, in today's world. Um, so we kind of hit on the volunteer training. And so I, I took our volunteer training as coaches too. Oops. And so we kind of, it kind of hit at the same time that they had a thank you coach, the thank you coach week or the coach appreciation week came on and uh, the NCC peak, course for coaching athletes with disability was free at the same time we were doing our volunteer training so I had all my volunteers and our coaches take that and then myself and a few of our other coaches took the Canadian Tire jump start and I really enjoyed the Canadian Tire uh, program as it really talked more about the language like Matt talked about about kind of the appropriate language and and how to how to communicate, I guess, with the families of those with the, with the ability, disabilities. And then kind of just in the last couple of weeks, we've been in the process of talking with Pickering about their volunteer training, like Matt had said, their three hour training. So I'm hoping that we can work with that and adapt it into Weyburn. We'll bring some kind of volunteer and training course as well. And then obviously we did the respect and support and criminal record checks. Um, as per SAS soccer for coaching. Um, I, I went with the soccer for life for any of our coaches. Um, we also put them through some special Olympics. We went through the community sport and the competition course. And that's when I think later on in the player pathway, if we ever wanted to go special Olympics provincials, uh, their recommendation is having this comp competition course that they provide. But the reason I went for soccer for life for our coaches is I think you know, we learn how to adapt our own pro programming, uh, whether it be space or time or equipment. Um, and, and my experience with doing this in short time in the all abilities is that knowledge of learning how to adapt 
our soccer programming is just an extension of how to adapt in all abilities. And so I really found that beneficial. And so for me, when we set up, that was kind of the requirements we were going to put through is have our coaches with the soccer for life uh, training. So kind of my experience so far. So we started in um, October, 2019. And we started by following Canada Soccer's long-term player development, and it follows the same stages, but they include a, a first involvement or a first awareness part in there. And that, that for me was uh, we had a, a, first in, a first involvement session where we invited everybody to come out. Uh, no red, no red, so that they can come out and experience the program. They can meet the coaches. They can meet myself. They can. I can chat with the families and then the families can kind of see how their kids interact in our program. And then having that is that I got to see kind of who's interested in it, but it also gave the families an opportunity to see and make sure that what we're offering is going to be right for their kid. And I think that's important um, is to gain their comfort or knowing that we just didn't slap a program to that. We put some research into it. We developed a plan and, and and this is it and that you know if you feel comfortable with it we'd love for you to carry on in our in our programming um so after that first enrollment we started our sessions and we started with six and we still have six today um we're currently working on i've been approached to run an active start uh, all abilities program so in 2020 spring we're looking to roll out an active start all abilities program we have our junior all abilities, which is six to 12 years old, and then our senior from seven to 18. But I hope, like Matt, I opened it wide and I've, you know, I'm open to going older than that, depending on the groupings there. But so from that, I guess here's over the winter kind of what I've learned um, like coaching soccer is coaching soccer. Uh, soccer for players with disabilities is still soccer, and the skills still need to be coached. And like I mentioned before, the adaptive part of, of our sessions is just an extension of what we already do on a daily basis as coaches when we step on the field. Um, at that, that bit of information actually came from Dave Sora with Pickering. Um, when he said that to me, that kind of relieved some of my fear of starting this program. That it's, We're going out, these are athletes. They're not children with disabilities, they're, they're athletes coming out to learn soccer. And, and that's what I've always gone into every session with, is these are just athletes that want to come out, have fun, learn the game, meet some friends, and get some physical activity in. So I've always left that at that, and, and I think a lot of families have been appreciative of that, that we've just, it's a soccer program to them. Um, we did run in, we started off with just our six and then, you know, as flu season comes, we had a few people sick. So then some of our sessions, we only had three people we found a little bit challenging. So then we started offering to have our soccer programs, our other soccer programs come in. So our U9, U11, U13 groups come in for unified sessions. And I was quite blown away by the difference of how, the, the athletes in our all abilities program participated, but even their development from when we started bringing them on, like they just become more engaged because they had buddies out there and they had friends and they kind of just followed them along. And us as we had volunteers were with them, but it just brought a whole different perspective and, and really brought out a different dynamic in our sessions. And I really enjoy uh, our unified sessions. And we even went out to inviting schools, uh, church groups, um, church youth groups to come in. It's kind of anybody in our community that wants to come involved and be buddies in our sessions. Um, we've had some really great sessions with people that have come out so far. Um, accessible facilities. Uh, for me, I had, we had, I really had to put myself into, is this facility that we're offering good enough? Enough for someone in a wheelchair and that's not just whether or not they can get in and out of the building but it is are they able to get through the doors and definitely check in what the washrooms are like um my first 
facility, the, the accessibility was good, the doors were good, but the washrooms weren't. And so within the second week, I really changed into a different facility. And, you know, I was open and honest with the families about it, that <laughs> that was kind of my learning. And I guess there's probably going to be a lot of learnings as we move forward in this. But kind of, from, like I said, this, we're talking about our experiences, and that was to make sure our facilities were suitable uh, for all inclusive if that's what we wanted to do um, communication with the parents uh, as Matt said there they have been the best source about learning about the athletes so what what triggers them what sets them off what's the best way to learn you know I have one child with autism who doesn't really understand the language but understands and learns from pictures so I was able to go into the Canada soccer uh, communities fundamental and active start and print off big pictures of how to kick a ball and how to pass a ball and so we have those hanging up on the walls sometimes so they can really see and they learn from that so communication with the parents and I was always all open and honest with them up front about I know soccer I don't know much about disabilities that I am will learn and so we, I got to know what disabilities our players had and I did my research on that but I really said that I'm an open book like I really encourage them to communicate with me after practice if there's stuff they see that I'm missing you know I, I the language like if there's language in there that you know please approach me because it's all learning thing for me but I guarantee them that with our drive and kind of our passion for this program to go forward in Wayburn and with their help with communicating and helping us that we can really pave the way and making sure this program lasts for a long time in Weyburn, which is our term goal, right? Is, is to have this and grow and hopefully grow into what Matt and Pickering FC has done into the, to, you know, a large amount of kids being able to love soccer and play the game. Um, adaptive equipment. For me, really, like there wasn't much extra cost. We we purchased extra different types of balls. Um, so we found some balls that are more geared toward the autism that got beads in them or they don't roll so far away. Uh, in the picture, you can see Max. He's got cerebral palsy. He's got a little bit of foot movement um, and a little bit of hand movement. So we bought a big, uh, I think it was a 36-inch ball. And so he kind of kicks that around. And then we've bought some tennis balls for him. So, so when we do toe taps or do soul rolls, the coaches give Max his tennis ball and he uses his hand back and forth to do the soul rolls or taps the tennis ball when he does toe taps. So you kind of get that fine motor, fine motor skills um, that we're learning with the rest of the players. But for, for what I've found, it really has not been at any extra cost besides of the purchase of a few different balls. Uh, we had gone out and got sponsorship for our facility costs through the winter and through the shirts. Um, but it really was not, not much more of a cost to our club for that. Uh, the next experience was, you know, making the families real feel part of our club. Um, kind of the one big thing that we did is we had a club day with JJ Soccer, uh, Accelerator FC, and I had asked Jason Jones if he'd be interested in having an all abilities game. And we really didn't know how it was going to go over. I just asked him to you know, throw out six players and I'll invite our all abilities team. And we had an actual, you know, 40 minute game, two 20 minute halves. And it was one of the best experiences I think that I've had all winter to, to see the, how much fun the kids had to actually play a game but even to see how Moose Jaw team reacted to these players and included them and really made the experience special for them was really amazing to see. And so a lot of the feedback I got from families was that club day and that game and that experience and, and how it was just awesome for them to see their kid getting to play in an actual soccer game. So if, that experience of including them into our club and making them feel part of our club um, is something more that, that kind of we're aiming to, um, you know, we're looking at player, making player cards for them and different little things to really make them feel that they're part of Weyburn soccer. 
and that's kind of my experience. Like I said, we started in November. We've had a lot of fun. Um, this program has really opened my eyes into to the need for it. Um, and it's kind of one of the best things that I've done in a long time. The, the families are really appreciative of the opportunity to come out and play soccer. I'm really looking forward to doing things in the in the spring with our active start and with our all abilities programs and really hoping to grow, um, grow the sport, grow the program. And I really hope that other clubs within Saskatchewan uh, have a good look at it too. Um, it, it's very special and really amazing to see once this program gets going that you get to play a part and, and helping other people play soccer. And, and that's where I'm at today. And kind of that's where, I left off here before I turn it back to Laura is kind of now we choose forward we choose inclusion and we choose to grow together and we'll talk about diversity and inclusion and I feel that we're all stronger uh, together when we're able to offer programs like this so uh, I'd like to thank you guys all for you know signing in today I'd like to thank Laura and SAS Soccer for the opportunity this is a first for me and uh, I very much appreciate it and big thanks to Matt for coming and doing this as well. Uh, I learned lots tonight, so thank you. Awesome, thanks so much, Tyler. So Tyler's just gonna give me the screen back. So um, now I'm just going to talk briefly about the programs and services that we are, one second, sorry. Okay. Um, someone just let me know if you're getting double feedback. I'm just sharing my video. So uh, I'm just going to talk briefly about the programs and services that Saskatchewan Soccer is now expanding to provide. Um, and the first thing I'm going to do is show you uh, a promotional video that we actually went down and filmed with um, Weyburn a few weeks ago. And the reason that we did this is because we want to expand adaptive soccer in Saskatchewan. And in on YouTube, I could not find anything that showed um, what this looks like. And so I thought, why don't we just go um, do that and um, take that since it's happening in our own backyard. So um, Raheem, I know you're still here. If you just open up your chat and then if you can't hear the sound when I start this, just let me know quickly, that would be fantastic. So I'm just gonna play this now. My name is Tyler Hillstead and I'm the technical director for the grassroots and all abilities programs for the Wayburn Soccer Association. I missed you guys coming to play soccer. I did, it's my favorite thing to do. I wasn't comfortable with having kids sitting on the sideline. We had our first involvement session where we had six come out and we still have that six today. We've moved our program into also including Unified, so we have uh, other soccer groups, other soccer ages come in, and also the kindness groups from the schools. It gets to be a kid, yeah, and play with, and it's not so strict, you know, like, you know, they can kick around the ball, and sometimes he gets distracted, and that's okay, and give him time, and he'll come back in. And we do our little warm up and do our stretches, and then we run into our soccer drill, so we'll do whatever my theme or topic of the day would be, either shooting or passing or dribbling, and we'll just go through three or four of those uh, specific activities, and then at the end we'll maybe break off to a game and have a little fun three-on-three -three game oh, or something. Like Good job! There's different types of balls to different types of disabilities. Uh, we've got the big balls for the children in the wheelchairs. We've got balls with beads in them for more tiered to the kids with autism. 
Uh, and then we got our futsal balls, which are low bounce balls, which just help us on the hard floors in the winter time. Hey. So we usually have a coach and then a one-on-one -on -one volunteer. So we have a volunteer for each participant. They had a, actually a game a couple weeks ago with another team and it was so awesome to see him out there and kicking the ball and it's nice that, you know, he gets a chance to do this. Green light, let's go! Saskatchewan Soccer's mission is to develop great people and develop um, lifelong participation through healthy communities with soccer. So integrating programs like this is uh, we're trying to get everyone involved, all types of abilities, and so that just fits well within our mandate and we're trying to expand soccer so more people can participate. Soccer is a highly adaptable sport, so that just makes complete sense that we would move into offering soccer for people with different uh, abilities as well. What do you like about soccer? Coaches. What's your favorite part about soccer? Ball. Ball. Mm -hmm. Inclusion makes us all stronger. It's just so good to see that these young people just doing what kids do. They're, they're, they have that opportunity. To have this program and have Max have his moment to shine and have family members come and cheer him on the same way that they come and watch my other kids. It's amazing and it's wonderful and heartwarming. And you just want your kids to be involved and be able to have so many opportunities to just be like all the other kids that it's just a wonderful program that he gets to do that. When they come through the doors, they're smiling already and that, that's the best feeling in the world. Love it. Tyler demonstrates that coaching is coaching is coaching and um, it, all it takes is an open heart and a willingness to try. So I would encourage anyone to do that. And being able to offer it to, to a group of kids that have been sidelined for this long and seeing them out there is just an unbelievable feeling. Like it, it brings joy to my heart and a smile every time I get to step foot out on the field with these kids. So I would just like to thank Lindsay Holmson Creative Services uh, for filming that for us. And um, we greatly appreciate it and look forward to the official launch at the AGM that's coming up in a couple weeks. And using this as promotion of, of adaptive soccer programs, um, hopefully in the future. So just a few notes about our programs and services. So first of all, um, Saskatchewan Soccer has developed a guide to inclusive soccer, offering soccer to athletes with all abilities. We incorporated mass feedback. We used some feedback from um, a few different sources. So this is a great um, resource on our website. We also have a brand new adaptive soccer resources page, which is located under the player tab on the SSA website, which talks about the resources available for other, uh, for all the types of disabilities and includes a lot of the resources and whichever are not there, I'll be adding to the webpage that Matt and Tyler shared tonight, as well as other um, program opportunities in Saskatchewan, such as Saskatchewan Wheelchair Sports and Saskatchewan um, Blind Sports. So um, we would love for athletes dis with disabilities to be participating in our program but if they're not participating in our program, we still want them to be participating in sport. So there are other opportunities available if this isn't the right choice for them and we want all people to play. We have here a new promotional video um, and we are thank you to SAS Sports um, and their grants. We have purchased some adaptive equipment. So right now we have um, the balls that Tyler is describing. We bought um, two blind, uh, uh, sorry, two kits for athletes um, with visual impairments and who are blind. So those include balls with bells in them and then eye shades. So that, that makes the playing field equal for everyone. We have um, the balls, the sensory balls that are heavier to the foot so they don't bounce as far or bounce as high. They feel a little bit different for people with sensory processing. And then we also purchased some large um, balls, 13 inch balls and have some soccer um, wheelchair guards for 
um, players, athletes who will play with um, wheelchairs and power wheelchairs, uh, those are considerably more expensive than you might um, guess, as well as the special um, nets that are available. So we've purchased a set of nets, uh, which are metal plates with stands so that the poles come up nice and high so, you, so um, players in wheelchairs can see those. And also they don't get tangled in the netting of the nets. And we have this available so that if you have athletes or would like to try this program in your community, we can loan this equipment to you to try it before you invest in the equipment. Also, we are proud to say that we will be bringing Matt in this fall during Thanks Coach Week in September to do adaptive soccer coach training. Um, so there will be, we're aiming for four dates in Saskatchewan across the province. So if you're interested to get some training in that regard, Matt will be here later this year. And then of course, MAP grant funding is available to start this program with the population-based funding, but also the special project. This year we have up to $5,000 available to start or expand adaptive soccer programming, um, if that's something you're interested in. We also have a new adaptive soccer member strategy. So it includes all of those programs. Uh, and services that I just mentioned, along with these elements. So it's important for us that we use inclusive and person first language. We acknowledge the person before we acknowledge the disability. And um, our code of conduct reflects that we welcome people regardless of ability. We also acknowledge um, parents, guardians, and caregivers. We know that um, some, some people with disabilities do not live in the homes of their parents or are under the guardianship of their parents. So we acknowledge this and we have changed our languaging in our policy to reflect this. We also have a partnership with Special Olympics Saskatchewan. We're proud to support the programs in Regina, Saskatoon, Humboldt, Estevan, and other locations across the province. And as of last year, we introduced the Special Olympics Provincial Championships. The only reason why we didn't have them this year is a lot of the athletes who participate uh, went on to Special Olympics Nationals that were the following week. And so just with the nature of multi-sports, um, we wanted them to rest up to give their best there. So that we'll be bringing that back again in the future. We also have our Adaptive Soccer Resources webpage, which I mentioned. We pr promote the men's national para team. And if there are athletes who um, fall in the categories of, of potentially playing for that team in Saskatchewan, we can put you in touch uh, with Drew, who is the head coach there, and bring him in to ID those athletes. So that is something we talk with him on, a, on an ongoing basis and will definitely do if um, there's someone who might be interested in ID opportunity. And lastly, we are supportive of adaptive program development. If you let me know that, or Nicole, when she comes back, that you're interested to start an adaptive program and have specific questions, you're not sure where to go to for the answers, uh, we're able to do some research and support you with what we have available. So I'd like to thank you for tuning in for all of this time. This covers everything here. So I'm going to open it up to questions. If you have a question for Matt, Tyler, or myself, you can just uh, unmute yourself and ask or type it into the chat box and I will uh, read it out for the group. So um, if not, thank you for participating and um, have a great evening. So any questions for Matt or Tyler? So Darcy says, thank you for the presentations and great work. Thank you so much, Darcy. Awesome, so it doesn't sound like there are any questions, but of course, you can um, 
you can contact me by email or I can put you in touch with Matt. And um, thank you so much for attending. We'll be posting this on our website and I hope you have a great evening. Great stuff. Thank you, Laura. Thanks so much, Matt. Thanks, Laura. Take care. We'll speak soon. You betcha. Thanks so much.